to another Geeky Gentleman Character Discussion. I'm Sid Partu. Joining me today to fill in for Steve is the Comics Kid 299, a.k.a. Ruben DeBoard, the most delicious geeky gentleman. Hello, Ruben. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, you picked our character to discuss today, so who are we discussing? We are talking about Professor Charles Xavier of the X-Men. And that's interesting because Steve and I, one of our first character discussions was on Magneto, oddly enough. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought this, this should be an interesting little twist of events to talk about, uh, Xavier. So, um, let me just start by asking, do you actually like Professor Xavier? Does anyone actually like Professor Xavier? Uh, I think I do at times, and then there are times where we're not meant to like him. Uh, but, like, there are some, some comics where I really... I like what he's trying to do, and he's a very flawed character. And sometimes people will say that about a character who's just straight up unlikable. Uh, like there are times where a character is nothing but flaws, and I just can't stand that character. Uh, but then there are times where, like Professor X, I feel like is a flawed character who's very interesting, and I do like him despite some of the things he's done. Yeah, I guess I can see that. Like there is an undeniable charm to Xavier. And it's it's weird for me to talk about him because I mostly only know Xavier from the movies and shows. Mm-hmm. Um I've read I can probably count on one hand the number of X-Men comics I've read. Mm-hmm. Um I've just X-Men's got a really really crazy ass continuity that is of all things I feel the most unapproachable about like getting into a world of comic books. Um, and so I've never really gotten into the, the comic side of Xavier, but do you feel like the movies do a decent job capturing what, like, who that character is? Uh, yeah, for the most part. I I think it's one of those things, it's, I, and I've always kind of felt like superhero movies always have a bit of a disadvantage at approaching a large comic book universe because they're doing in two and a half hours what comic books have, you know, 60 years of single issues that come out every month where they can do, uh, you know, they can build on all that continuity and have long running subplots and character development that you have to handle all that in two and a half hours. Even if you're trying to build a franchise, you're still in theory doing just a, you know, standalone movie. So like the movies, the X-Men movies, uh, you know, the first two, uh, really all of the movies with, uh, the first three movies anyway, they take out Xavier pretty early so that the X-Men have to handle it on their own. And that's kind of problematic because Professor X is one of the more powerful mutants and his ability would be, it would lend itself very well to, okay, here's the bad guy. You can just think really hard at that bad guy. And then the problem is solved and the day is saved. So like there's a pattern in those movies where in the first one, he gets poisoned by Cerebro. In the second one, he gets kidnapped by Stryker. In the third one, they just kill him. Like, they have to take out Xavier so that the X-Men are the ones who deal with the threat. Um, and then it was weird Then we got the reboot with First Class, and suddenly Xavier is one of the X-Men proper, right? Yeah. Um, and those are really interesting. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing to talk about. The X-Men movies have had a lot of problems just with maintaining a consistent level of quality. But the one thing they've always done well is casting. Mm -hmm. Like, God, Hugh Jackman is literally the perfect pick for Wolverine in every way except his height. And at that point, Mm -hmm. who cares? Um, 
you know, Michael Fassbender and Ian McKellen, they cast Doctor or they cast Magneto perfectly twice. And, and and Professor X, I think. Yeah. Patrick Stewart and James McAvoy do just an amazing job portraying Professor X at wildly different points in his life. Like I don't think X-Men Apocalypse is a great movie and I don't think it's an awful movie. But man, I really like uh Xavier in that movie. Mm-hmm. I, I just really like what he's doing. McAvoy like really milks and sells that role in, in some fantastic ways. Um you know that that trailer shot, I've never felt power like this before. Ooh, that's just a really good one. And then like when he brings uh Apocalypse into his house, into the mansion, and he's like having the mind palace fight. Mm-hmm. It was really cool, man. It was really, oh, yeah. really cool. Um, so, yeah, but for me, being someone that, that experienced Xavier mostly through the movies, I've got a very different thing because ultimately, like, he... The worst thing Xavier does in the movies is arguably what he does to Jean Grey, but X3 kind of justifies what he does to Jean Grey. Yeah. Uh, and and it's one of those kind of chicken and the egg things where he suppresses her natural personality, her her real persona, and then she becomes a supervillain that kills like all these people. But then you have to wonder like, would she have killed all these people if he hadn't done that to her? So like, it, it's a very that movie is not great, uh, and I I will maintain that all of the problems the X-Men movies have had, like continuity problems and just like, just the sheer number of like, okay, this movie's garbage and this movie's trying to course correct, all of that stems from X3. But I do think that's a very, it's an interesting take on Professor X. And it's true to the comics because Professor X did a lot of morally reprehensible stuff over the last, you know, 50 years. A lot of it just came to light in the last 15 years or so, but some of it goes way back. For example, do what? For what's an example? Oh, like uh, well, the Danger Room. He had uh, you know this holographic Danger Room made out of alien technology, and then we found out in Joss Whedon's Astonishing X Men that it was actually a sentient robot that he was basically enslaving to train the X Men. And it's implying, I think it just straight up says he knew it was a sentient robot, but because he believed in training the X Men so much, so that he could have a mutant army of his own that he basically justified doing that to danger uh the character that eventually that was the danger room and then like there was uh years ago this was like around the time of the civil war comics uh we find out that uh, when the original team of x-men was stranded uh, on an island and in not in giant size x-men issue one he puts together a new team which like storm colossus nightcrawler wolverine to go and rescue the original x-men we find out that actually he recruited another team before that, and then they all died. And then Professor X just pretends like that never happened. He wipes Cyclops' mind and makes him forget that he had a brother who died on that mission just so that he can get the original X-Men rescued and then pretends like that never happened. Like, there's all Dude, sorts of stuff. you know what that makes me think of? What? Professor Farnsworth from Futurama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny. Um... No, so, yeah, it it seems that they really write him as a very opportunistic character at the best, but, like, there is an underlying optimism and and a charm to the character when he's written as not a bastard that I, I, you know, you just can't help but find really, really beautiful. Like, again, I go to First Class, which is, for my money, probably the best X-Men movie. Um, Like, that scene with magneto as he's trying to convince him that he is capable of moving gigantic things like that satellite dish Mm -hmm. and he he goes in and shares his memory that's a really really beautiful scene and i just i love the way that they that their friendship is built there like i i mean i'll just be perfectly honest with it i don't think that magneto and and charles are the best of friends. I think that if if you're being completely honest, I feel like those two are gay and <laughs> they hate each other. They're they're like in a lovers quarrel. Um 
And maybe I'm maybe I'm shipping too hard, but man, I just so read their relationship that way. Mm -hmm. Other people have shipped it like that, so you're not the only one reading that into the those movies. Um, and that is what's great about First Class and the way McAvoy does it is like we've already had three movies where we see Professor X as almost stodgy, like very old and just not cool. And then we get this movie where he's drinking and he's flirting and he is the definition of cool. And at first you're thinking like, okay, by the end of the movie he's going to be Professor X that we know or at least closer to that. But here he's just like like some idiot who's just out, you know, getting drunk off his butt. But then like when he reads Moria's mind at the bar and then you start to see a glimpse of the Professor X that we know. It's like, okay, he's not all fun and games. He's able to get serious even this early in the movie. And so it's really awesome that like around that time when he's teaching Magneto, he's teaching everybody. And he's showing each of them, like, this is how you can be the best mutant you can be. And we see that he's already the Professor X that we know. He's just a little he he's a little less stiff, I guess. And mm -hmm. uh it's really interesting that he's able to play both of those seamlessly. Like, it's not like he's just turning on a light switch and suddenly he's playing the Patrick Stewart version. He's incorporated these two seemingly opposing versions of the character into one performance, and it's really good. Yeah, yeah, I really like what McAvoy does, but at the same time, there's something so incredibly perfect about Patrick Stewart's portrayal in particular, in Logan, um, like a lot of people really like Logan and they, they say it's this great like father-daughter kind of thing between, um, you know, Wolverine and, and X-23. And yeah, that relationship's really touching. The thing that works the best for me about Logan is, is easily Xavier. Mm -hmm. um, there's something so unbelievably sad about seeing Xavier just have, have having gone senile. Oh, yeah. And, and still in the back of his head, he just gets these little fleeting moments where he's that kindly figure that you know. And and just those beautiful moments where, like, he he's the one that's able to connect with X-23, and he's the one that's able to get her to, like, um, come along with them. And, and he starts kind of the quest of the movie. Um, it's it's just so sweet because he's, like, he's got this mission. And that's been his whole life is just helping mutant children. Mm -hmm. And when you when you connect the idea of mutanthood to, to um, oppressed uh, minority group... It's it, there's something incredibly engaging because even though Professor X is a mutant, I would honestly be fine if someone wanted to do an interpretation where he's not. Period. End of story. No, no like weird circumstance. There's something so incredibly appealing about like his power makes him able to do all this stuff and comprehend all these things, but there's something so to him just he it's his life mission to just help people that need it. And and I really like that about him. It's funny you say that about him not being a mutant because there's a TV show that I've recently been watching uh, and it's basically the X-Men in everything oh, but name only. Legion? Uh, Alphas is the one. Okay. Out. It, like, it's not even a Marvel thing. It's just a... Uh, it was from, like, 2012. It was on the Sci-Fi Channel. And it has... Um, I don't know any of the actors' names, but... Uh, Start Straythrone or something. Um, he was one of the bad guys in one of the Bourne movies, uh, but he is basically Professor Xavier without any superpowers. Um, and it's kind of a government-funded X-Men team. Uh, it only lasted two seasons, um, and it used to be on Netflix. It's not anymore, unfortunately. But uh, it's a really interesting show, and he's basically playing Professor X as a uh, you know mid uh, to late fifties uh, kind of old hippie Professor X, kind of. Uh, it's hard to explain, but he's he's a really good actor, and I think he's doing a really good job. I, I don't know if they told him, hey, you're basically pro playing Professor X, but that's definitely the vibe I'm getting when you watch that show. Um, and when it's very similar to what you just said, where he's his goal is just to help people with these abilities and try and help them function. Because a lot of, in that show, 
they they do this thing where you could have a really awesome power, but then there's some huge side effect that hinders you in some way, it, and they play it like disabilities almost. Um, and it's That's really interesting. interesting. Uh, yeah. it, it seems a lot of shows do that because that was kind of I only ever watched the first season of Heroes, but that really felt like kind of an X Men ripoff. And there was like I think he was like an Indian doctor or something, and mm-hmm. he kind of he he basically did the whole speech on evolution that we get from the movies. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, I don't know. There's something just so wonderfully tragic about what um, what Patrick Stewart does with Xavier. Uh, and I don't know, like, you're right. He does get removed so much from the first three movies. He's not in the either of the Wolverine movies except for a cameo. Mm-hmm. Um, most of his character comes from the the uh prequel films and yet there's something just so good about like the the little bits he has he does so perfectly which is why Stuart i i think takes the role for me um he he gets these little snippets but he does them so well uh that it's it's kind of crazy and i i really love him in logan because it, it kind of just all comes crashing down and and he talks about how he was ready to play Professor X again until he played him in Logan, and then he was like, no, this has got to be it. This has got to be where I stop. Mm-hmm. And that was, that's really crazy. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed that about him. Let me ask you this, because I, I think this is an interesting thing to think about, because the comparison a lot of people make is that um, Professor X is a Martin Luther King allegory and Magneto is a Malcolm X allegory. Is it weird that Professor X has a mutant army then? Uh, it is weird. And a lot of, like, I think that comes from Stan Lee. He would often say that. And I, I disagree with that analogy. Um, I think that's one of those things where, and I know you're not as big of a Stan Lee fan as some people are. Um, I think this is one of those things where, after the fact, where a lot of the character development had been done for both Professor X and Magneto... I think Stan Lee kind of retconned his own uh, involvement with the characters and said, yeah, he had all this planned out where they were uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Because when you go back and look at the Silver Age X-Men, that's very clearly not going on. Uh, (laughs) Magneto is a raging psychopath. um, And, you know, you and I talked about the movie Selma. And very briefly, we get an interaction between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King's wife. And there's some animosity there, but it's not hostile. Uh, It's very much just ideological. And they both have the same goals. They're just going about them in different ways. And that's... As in first class, uh, they said, like, no, we don't have the same goals. Uh, Magneto wants mutants to rule over humans. Professor X wants humans and mutants to coexist. So while they start off as friends, they don't have the same goals. And uh, I think you look at, like, the Chris Claremont X-Men stuff, which started in 75 and went all the way up to 91. There is more of a frenemy thing going on between Magneto and Charles but it's still not really Malcolm X and uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, it is really weird that this guy who wants mutants and humans to co- coexist peacefully is training a mutant army of teenagers. That's all really weird. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes perfect sense because, the, the like, how many mutant genocides have there been? So, like, yes, I, I totally agree with the idea that the mutants need a standing army for self-defense and preservation. Um, and I kind of see... That's what I kind of feel like Magneto's doing. I feel like Professor X has more of a strike team than an army, per se. But mm-hmm. that's that's kind of semantics. Um, but, I don't know, it's just... That's, that's something I've always found weird, is people will make that comparison of, oh, Professor X is more like um, Martin Luther King. And I'm like, he has an army of mutants. I'm, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, people say that, and I don't think... They either don't really know that much about history, real-world history, or they don't that know that much about the history of the X-Men going back to, like, the 60s. But um, And I think that is, that's something that Stan Lee has said in interviews, and I, I think that's something he may believe it, but I don't think it's true. I, um, Stan Lee is infamous for shit like that. Like, his, his whole story of what he thought of creating Spider-Man, he's had to backtrack on and go, like, 
All right, I've told this story for years. I don't even know if it's true at this point. Mm-hmm. All right, <laughs> like that's just that's just Stan Lee being uh, a bit of an egotist and and kind of grabbing credit where he doesn't deserve it. So what and I guarantee and also, you happened is someone made that comparison and Stan Lee said, "Oh yeah, that's what I was thinking." Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I do think that um, Professor Xavier, you know, talking about like some of these morally reprehensible things he's done, um, I think he's so interesting because. He he has – this is like the picture definition of the ends justify the means where mm. uh, he's a guy who wants a utopian society. He wants mutants and humans to uh, shake hands and make babies and everyone to just be smiling and it's all happy time. And he does some pretty terrible stuff to get to that point. And he knows there are people who will fight him on that. So that's why he needs a mutant strike team, as you said. And so he does things like enslaving a sentient computer to train a mutant strike team. Because if he doesn't, people like Magneto are going to take over the world. And then everyone is screwed. And so it's very interesting to see him do these terrible things and justify these things in his mind. And then later on, people will call him out on it. And even he will call himself out on it. Like there was a run about 10 years ago where professor X was just going all over the world, fixing some of the stuff that he had done. Uh, like he told rogue for years that he would help her, uh, control her powers and he never did. And then he goes and says, you know what? I need to fix that. I need to just help her control her powers and stuff like that. Um, and so that's a really fascinating run. It's by uh, Mike Carey, um, and uh, it's just Professor X atoning for his sins. And, like, he's a really interesting character. And, like, you you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast that does anyone actually like Professor X? And I think that was, like, a question that was being bounced around the Marvel offices around the time of Avengers versus X-Men. And I'm pretty sure everyone in that room said, no, nobody likes Professor X because – They killed him off in Avengers vs. X-Men, and it's a really weird thing where Professor X wasn't even in that story, and they just brought him in to confront Cyclops, who was possessed by the Phoenix Force, so that Professor X could say, hey, stop doing that, and then Cyclops kills him off. Like, it it feels very shoehorned in, and you look at, like, uh, what... Uh, Bendis, who took over the X-Men books after that, uh, in some of his outlines for the series, it's very clear that they worked backwards to try and make Professor X die. Like, that wasn't something that just organically came out of the story. And uh, as far as I know, Professor X still isn't back. Um, I'm not completely caught up on uh, X-Men stuff, but uh, it's one of those things, like you said, I don't think a lot of people really like the character. I think they just, like, they used to... they, They maybe like some things about him, but they feel like the X-Men has grown beyond the need to have a Professor X. And I mean, that's the ideal for me. I don't like, like, do this generally with all comics. You know, Bruce Wayne needs to die. Dick Grayson needs to be Batman forever. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, you know, same with uh, Professor X Magneto. I understand the need to appeal to new readers and get them interested in comics and and i wouldn't want to walk out of an x-men movie and then try to go read x-men comics and oh yeah all the characters i'm interested in are long dead because all their stories are over Mm -hmm. at the same time it's that constant thing of resetting everything back to status quo and it it kills character development and and kills the range of a story um so all that aside, I can I can see why Professor X uh, has been killed off, and and if he is gone for a uh, longer term, that's I'm I'm totally okay with that to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I I do like the character. I think that there's interesting stuff that can be done with him, uh, and they may bring him back sometime soon, or they may wait another five to ten years. I don't know. Um, sometimes there are characters who they kill off, and I instantly think, like, they'll bring them back soon, and then they never do. And then there's characters they kill off, and I think, well, that character is definitely never coming back, and then they do bring him back. So Century. Uh, I, yeah, I was thinking of Cyclops' dad. Uh, they killed him off uh, ten years ago, and then brought him back recently-ish, like, three or four years ago, and I was I was the number one person who was surprised that they brought him back. Like, And Professor X is a big-time character, been around since 63. Like, He's been in like six movies. I would definitely think he would be one of the first ones they would bring back. Hmm. But, yeah, but, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of cool if they leave him dead. Uh, I think he and Magneto need to need to bite the dust for a while. Um, yeah. Just I can... because like, I, I feel like that debate's, you know, it's been had long enough. 
Um, and I just feel like the the X Men and the Brotherhood and and humanity just kind of need to deal with it themselves as opposed to having it personified in two characters like that. Um, otherwise, I don't know some other stuff about Professor X. Uh, how how do you feel about him being the most powerful telepath? Um, I don't have a problem with it. Um, it is I've often wondered because if he's there training basically every mutant and there's hardly any mutants before him uh like in the first issue of x-men he says he thinks he's the first mutant and i've often wondered who is there to train him like if he's so good at it who is there to help him hone his abilities because in theory he should have been put into a home because he's hearing all this screaming in his head and he can't tune it out like that's what they did in the ultimate comics they did that with jean gray where she was like institutionalized because she couldn't tune out all the voices like you have to wonder how did professor x get this good um i don't have a problem with him being the master but you do i do wonder how he got that way without help yeah and i don't know there's something for me where we're in when he's like powerful enough to like what is it in it's an x2 where he's hooked into cerebro and he has the power to literally kill all of humanity yeah that's just ridiculous to me like mm-hmm. at that point it's too big and it, it it just loses some of the the heart to me um and and like at other points too i don't have the pro- a problem with him being able to stop one person's brain activity like to just keep them breathing but like shut down their motor functions shut down their ability to remember anything for a couple minutes like mm-hmm. he does in in first class when he's at the fbi yeah. I don't have a problem with him being able to do that to one person. When it's a whole fucking building, it gets to be too much to me. Or like or the planet, like you were saying with Cerebro. Yeah, at, at that point, it just gets to be too much, and I'm just like, no, just give it a rest for a little bit. Just just tone it down a little bit. It's it's too much. It, it, it becomes, like, too epic at that point for me, and I don't know, something about that turns me off. Yeah, um, that's that's fair. And they do that kind of thing with a lot of characters where, like, this character starts off this powerful and then by the time you get, like, 30, 40 years later, they're much more powerful. Like, Wolverine started off, like, he had a healing factor, but he could die. If he, if he got stabbed in the chest and then tried to run a marathon and didn't give his body time to heal, he would die. And... They, uh, that's the same with Professor, and now, like, you know, a nuclear bomb could be dropped on him and he could just walk it off. Like, that's kind of the same with Professor X. Like, they, he started off, you know, he's a, he's a, got mind powers, but he couldn't, you know, control a whole building full of people. And now, like, who knows what he could do if they had, if he was still there. Yeah, it's, and I don't know, I just don't like that. I just don't find it appealing. Um, Something you mentioned earlier was was the idea of Charles wanting to create a utopia, and I don't know if you read uh, any of Hudlin's Black Panther or how you felt about the idea of of T'Challa and Storm getting married, but I really do like the um, the volume The Bride when they're at T'Challa and Storm's wedding, and like Xavier comes to give her away, and like he was apparently dead in the comics at the time because it's comic books but like he shows up and says i'd like to be the one to give you away if you would allow me and she says yes um and like they have a whole conversation with how he feels about her marrying a non-mutant and he's like no this is exactly the world i want and i don't know something about that just really worked for me that he's got this you know father figure role with her and Mm -hmm. and just the way in which the the whole um that whole thing worked out really, really well in a really cool way to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I quite liked it. Yeah, I, it's been a while since I've read that volume. That's actually the only volume from Hudlin's run I read. Uh, wasn't crazy about that whole story, or I didn't really like... Well, I didn't like how it affected the X-Men books, and I know you you and I have talked about it before, where you, you liked H- Hudlin's run, and I was looking at it as an X-Men fan and how it kind of it had this ripple effect on the X-Men books. And so we got some pretty bad stories on the X-Men side where they were s- trying to set that story up. Um, mm. And then uh, I wasn't crazy about some of Storm's characterization in that book. But like I say, it's been a while since I read it. So if I reread it, I might think differently of it. But that's... Well, you'll get there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's For those the... that don't know, if you're if you're a big X Men fan watching this, uh, Ruben on his channel, Comics Kid twenty ninety nine, 
is reviewing literally every X-Men comic? Yeah, trying to. Uh, there's going to be some that I just won't be able to get to. Like, once the further you get into the future, it just branches off into, like, 50 billion X-Men titles. So it'll be like, I'll spend 400 years trying to cover the 90s or whatever. But, yeah, that's the plan, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I I think that that does it for most of Professor X. Uh, we just got to do recommendations and, and favorite... Um, like designer version uh so i'm gonna like kind of wrap a couple of those into just one um logan for recommendation as well as uh first class and days of future past i really like those uh as far as movies go design wise it's gotta be um x x1 and x2 uh, with Patrick Stewart, just in that, you know, it's the little robotic wheelchair. It's got the X's on the wheels. It looks really, really good. I don't like the fucking 90s floaty thing that he's got in the uh, Fox cartoon. <laughs> I think that's ridiculous. <laughs> I kind of I have a soft spot for that. I have no rational reason why I like it. I just, nostalgia. Um, I, just something about 90s Marvel cartoons. Like, characters could not be in wheelchairs. They had to be in fucking floaty <laughs> chair things because it was the exact same thing with Scythe oh, yeah. in the Spider-Man cartoon. It was. I have no idea why. <laughs> I never even realized they both have the same wheelchair thing. I did not realize it's that. Wow. so weird. I don't get it. Like, he could have a floaty wheelchair. I kind of like what they, what they gave him in Dave of future past where it kind of like just hovers but just the fucking like it just looks like it's so cumbersome how the fuck does it get around <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like it's like the size of like a like huge like a small car yeah <laughs> How, how, he can't even get through like a door, like you know. I know. I don't know what the fuck they were thinking with that. Just give the man a chair. <laughs> uh, anyway, how about you? What is your uh, favorite design for Professor X, as well as some recommended stories or, or movies to watch and read? Um, well, stories. Uh, this is going to sound weird. I would recommend the Age of Apocalypse, where it starts off as a time travel story where spoilers professor X is killed before he founds the X-Men and then Magneto with Charles's dying breath. He basically says Magneto, like I need you to, you know, be a better person. So Magneto forms the X-Men and then apocalypse takes over the world. So Xavier is barely in it, but it's a really interesting look at what the world would have been like if Xavier hadn't been there. It's kind of a, a beautiful life sort of, um, or, is it? It's a wonderful life. Wonderful life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, different movie. Uh, um, but yeah, it's kind of like that, where Xavier is barely in the story, but you get to see like, okay, this is the impact that he had on the Marvel universe. If he wasn't there, it would have really gone to crap. So like, I would recommend that. And then as far as design, um, oh, I'm I may go with X Men Evolution. Um, that was. Uh, a cartoon that was going on right when I was getting into comics. And so uh, I, I think the first few seasons are kind of sort of prologue to what I think of as the actual X-Men. But then uh, once you get into like the later seasons, that show is really good. And I think Professor X, like when I hear his voice, a lot of times I'm hearing that guy and I don't even know the actor's name, but I think he, he really, he captured what I feel of Professor X. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. All right. I think that will do it um, uh, for for recommendations and stuff. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure who we'll be talking about next time. So you know, stay tuned for that, folks. We'll we'll figure something out. I'm sure. Uh, Ruben, thanks for doing this, though. Hey, not a problem. I was happy to do it. All right, cool. Uh, until next time, everyone. I'm the philosopher, and I'm the comic skid twenty ninety nine, and we are your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things.